Good evening, church. Welcome to our Friday night Bible study. Friday again. Feels like it's Friday every day at the minute. The weeks are flying past. Not long now until we'll all be gathered together again. A few more weeks, uh, God willing. Just going to open up with a couple of um, scriptures and then I'm going to invite Deacon Dom, who's going to be opening up in worship. And the first scripture is from Galatians 5, chapter 16. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these things are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, decisions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, rivalries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And one other verse which the Archbishop told us to reflect on this week, which was from Psalm, Psalms, Book of Psalms, Psalms 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. Praise God. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you once again for this day, Lord. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you're rich in mercy, Lord. We just want to give this night over to you, Lord, and just prepare the soul of our hearts, Lord. We just pray for your Holy Spirit to come and just change our minds, Lord, to change and soften our hearts, Father. Father, we continually pray for the Archbishop. We thank you, Father, that during this lockdown, consistently week in and week out, he has been feeding us your word, Lord. We just pray that you bless, cover, and protect him continually, Lord. We continually lift up and pray for our senior uh, pastor, Penny, as well, Lord, that you just bless, cover, and protect her. And we pray for the church as well, Lord. Anyone that may be struggling at this time, Lord, we just pray for that your healing hand will be upon them. And just prepare our hearts tonight for this word, Lord. In your wonderful name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So I'm just going to invite Deacon Dom, who's going to be opening up in worship. God bless you. God bless you, church. It's wonderful again to be with you and to lift up praise and worship this evening. Let's all come together. We're going to lift up um, some songs this evening. We're going to really lift up the name of God. We're going to sing, bless the Lord, all my soul. Amen. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. So let's lift up this evening. Joining with us. Oh, my soul, I worship. 
Give your name glory. We want to give you thanks this evening, Lord God. We want to bless your holy name. Amen. is 
beginning and the end, the Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb. And he truly is the name above all names, and he's worthy of all praise. And our hearts will truly sing, how great is our God. Amen. If you're at home, give, give the Lord a clap offering for his worthy to be praised. You know, we can say so much about God, but we truly need to be thankful for everything that God does for us, for the, for the storm that he holds our hands to and, and carries us through, for every step of that, that he walks with us. We truly need to give him thanks that, and even in this time, you know, we've been in, in lockdown, but some of us somehow have found a new freedom in, in God to be free. So we just want to give him the praise, the glory, and the worship this evening. Amen. Woo, amen. Amen. We're just going to move on to the next uh, portion of our service this evening. We're going to take up our offering, and as you know, many, many things um, that, that we do within the church, and your offering helps the church extend that work and to reach further out. So we just want to give the give over to um, the song now. God bless.
Nothing is impossible for you. You hold my world in your hands. We just want to give you the thanks and the praise. Let's pray this evening. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for tonight, oh God. Thank you for another opportunity, oh God, to come together, to sit at your feet this evening to hear your word. We want to thank you, Lord, for every single person that's watching this transmission. We ask that you bless them, that you be with them, oh God. If your word declares that when two or three are gathered in your name, that you will be there in the midst of them, oh God. And we just want to thank you, oh God, for your presence, for your visitation this evening, oh God. We want to thank you for the offering that's coming this evening. We ask that you just bless every single um, penny, oh God, every pound, oh God. Father God, just give us the wisdom and the discernment how to use to extend your kingdom, oh God. Bless those that have given this evening, oh God. And we ask that you bless those that, that, that couldn't give, Lord, that you'll that you meet their every need, Lord God. We want to thank you, Lord God. And right now, when we come before you, Lord God, we want to ask, Lord, that you just still our hearts, Lord God, clear our minds as, we, as we're in anticipation to hear your word this evening, Lord God. We ask that you bless our Archbishop. Cover him, protect him, and bless him, Lord God. That as he gives out, Lord, that truly you will give back unto him, Lord God. And that, Father God, he will truly speak your word this evening, Lord God. Cover him, bless him, and everything that he says and does. In Jesus' name we pray. So, amen. Amen and amen. As we invite Archbishop to share the word this evening. Amen. God bless you. Welcome to another instalment of uh, the Bible study on this wonderful Friday evening. Time is moving fast and we thank God for that we've survived actually the week. We've overcome and we're here to share fellowship together praise the lord i put out today on social media that the the title or the subject for today's message is who's my neighbor and it might be simple straightforward answer but it's quite deep revelation to understand who your neighbor is in the light of what we're seeing in the media and things happening around the world today so i want to just lay a foundation for the message this evening from the gospel of matthew chapter 25 Verse 31, it's a, study, it's a Bible study, so we're going to navigate through the Word of God, travel through the Word of God, and really draw the deep and rich meaning and significance of the Word of God, that those who are mature will grow, and those who are just coming on the journey will find direction for their spiritual lives, praise God. This is the Gospel of Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, so I won't take time just going over the things, let's just go into the passage, then we'll look at how we can expound on this powerful word this is the Lord's message verse 31 when the son of man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him then he will sit on the throne of his glory all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one one from another as a shepherd divides sheep his sheep from the goats and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did, when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assured I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Praise God. It's a powerful parable that God is given, that all is given, that we find towards the end of the Gospel of Matthew in relation to the criteria for salvation and uh, unity and approval from God. And this sets out the criteria of what, what it takes to please and find God's approval. There are six conditions that we must confront in relation to honour, in relation and in the light of our spiritual journey and our confession. And these six types of uh, conditions are hunger, thirst, being hospitable, being naked, being sick, and being incarcerated. These are the six conditions that we need to deal with in our lives on a physical level and on a spiritual level. 
Our Lord himself identified with these six conditions. That's why he speaks from a place of authority and a place of experience. Because I want to just take the, uh, these six items and just look at them and look how they relate to our Lord himself first and how we translate this through our lives and around our lives today. He says, well, for I was hungry and you gave me food. There's many different ways, as often I say, that we can hunger. One of them is physically, the other one is spiritually. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they should be filled. So there's a, there's a, a spiritual hunger that we need to desire above more than not the physical hunger. Because when we satisfy our physical hunger and we over satisfy our physical hunger, it becomes negative to us, detrimental to our physical well-being. That's why fast is often in order, must be put in place, that we need to spiritually fast and physically fast to have a, a spiritual connection. So we're not absorbed by the essential physical desires, that we're liberated from them, that we can transcend and see the spiritual realities of how God wants to speak into our lives. But let's see the way the Lord hungered. He right at the very beginning of his ministry, when he was 30 years old, after being baptised, from, by John or from John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness that he fasts 40 days and 40 nights. And it's no surprise that if you haven't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights, you're, gonna, you're going to hunger. And our narrative is in Matthew chapter 4, verse 2, it says this, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. And it begs the question, what type of hunger is, is this showing us about Jesus Christ, our Lord? What kind of hunger? What, what, what is he in fact hungering for? And the devil takes an opportunity because he sees the surface. He doesn't, he doesn't see the deep spiritual implication that Jesus is making in relation to his hunger. His hunger later in the scripture says is to do the will of him who sent me. But the devil was ignorant of this truth because the only way to have this revelation, to embrace, to, to receive this truth, is to have the relationship with the Holy Spirit. And unfortunately, the devil doesn't have that intimate relationship, intimacy with the Holy Spirit. So he says he hungers. And the devil challenges him and says, well, if you're hungry, if you are the son of God, make, turn this stone or these stones into bread. Believing that that was it, that was, that, 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 that was an end. He was trying to take him to an end, but Jesus' hunger was a means to an end. Well, the devil says, just satisfy your hunger for the moment. And this is what we often do. When we have challenges in life, we want a quick fix. But sometimes we look beyond that quick fix and see the greater, bigger picture and plan that God has for our lives. Praise God. The second time, in actually in the same Gospel of Matthew, we're told that Jesus hungers again. It's amazing because he's God incarnate. As God, he doesn't hunger. As God, he does not thirst. As God, he does not grow weary. But yet he limited himself so he can hunger, thirst, to identify with our needs. But his hunger is dual aspect. There's a dual aspect to his hunger. One is a spiritual hunger. One is a physical hunger. And the second time the Gospel of Matthew mentions Jesus hungering is in Matthew chapter 21, verse 18, when he's facing towards Jerusalem. He's about to be betrayed, to give it to the hands of, of, the, of the evil evildoers, of the wicked. And it says on the journey, he's hungering. He sees a fig tree and he hungers. I want to just qualify this before we move on. Because the Lord says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. What does this represent? This is in Matthew chapter 21, verse 18. It says this. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And you know, you want to connect with God, you've got to rise in the morning. He rose in the morning, but he himself defines the morning because he's the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. And he's the dawn. When he rises, when he journeys, any time Jesus steps out, it has to become morning, as we often say in previous messages. And he says, and seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again immediately the fig tree withered away so it comes to a particular place on the way to jerusalem he's hungry he sees the fig tree jesus knows all things he knew that the fig tree was barren did not bear fruit he knew times he knew seasons he knew that the fig tree did not have fruit but there was a metaphor this is an allegory this represents something beyond itself what the fig tree the thing that the fig tree represents is people we are supposed to be trees of righteousness. And when Jesus passes the, the, uh, past our lives, comes across our lives, he wants to see that we are fruitful. In which way, which way fruitful? Fruitful in relation to the virtues, to our character in relation to God. All he saw in this fig tree was leaves. And in fact, if you go right back to Genesis, when Adam and Eve transgressed, 
they, they transgressed, they, 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 they took off the fruit that God told them to abstain from taking of the knowledge of the knowledge of good and evil. When they were hiding, they took the leaves of the fig tree to cover their nakedness and their shame. And the thing is this, that he uses the same item to show that again he comes, that the tree represents humanity and he came to humanity and it was fruitless. It didn't have, it could not bear fruit. And there's a challenge there, we need to examine ourselves because the leaves represent the words. We're good at speaking, but sometimes our actions do not align with what we promise and what we say. We need to align our actions with our words. What the promises we make, we need to fulfill them and live up to them, praise God. And he challenged that tree and he told that tree it'll never bear fruit again. He cursed it immediately and withered. But that's a different message, a different story for another time. Because the Lord is hungry. Well, the Lord says, I was hungry, he says, and you gave me, and you, uh, uh, I was hungry and you gave me food. How do we give food? How do we satisfy the hunger of Jesus? The best way to satisfy the hunger of Jesus is obedience and is sacrifice. And it's servitude, praise God. And I want to look through the criteria, what this passage says, because people have gone off, have somehow deviated from what God requires from us as his people to really reflect his love into the world. Often we're caught up with denominations, with our own uh, circular, our own insular kind of mentality, and we're not looking at, we're looking inwards, and we think, we, we think we're the finished article. Or we, we, we define ourselves as Christians or a people of God in terms of denomination or who our friends are. The most important friend you need to have is God himself, praise God, amen? There's no friend like Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, praise God. Because the psalmist tells us that if God were hungry, he doesn't need to tell us. Psalm 50 verse 12 says this, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. We need to discern what God is requiring from us. And then he says, for the world is mine and all its fullness, everything belongs to God. So when we do something, it's not because God needs it. When we're giving something out, it's not because God needs it or, or, or God is lacking in anything. When we're doing something for God in the name of the Lord, serving his purpose, we're helping ourselves. When we're feeding the poor, we're feeding ourselves spiritually. The more we give out of ourselves, the more we grow internally in ourselves, in reflecting what God represents, what the Lord represents, praise God. That's power in that. There is power in that. Less is more in God. The more we have, the less we have left over. The more we give out, the more we have left over. And I often say this, that's the divine contradiction. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the philosophy, if you like, of the, uh, diminish increase. The more you, the less you have, the more you have left over, praise God. So the Lord is saying, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. We need to discern how we serve God to satisfy not just God's hunger, but, but his, the purpose of God in and through our lives. Praise God. Hallelujah. Proverbs 25 verse 21 says this, that we need to be a giving people, even we're not only giving to the people that love us, satisfy the people's hunger that love us, but we sometimes need to do with people that we don't find pleasant, we find challenging, we find uncomfortable to be around, we've got to do something for, for them. Proverbs 25 verse 21 says this, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to it. This is what Paul quotes from in the book of, in the epistle to the Romans. And if if he thirsts, give him water to drink. For as so you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. What, is, what does that mean? What's the implication there? If we're not doing this to condemn people or to punish people. We're doing them to bring a conviction that they see your good nature and your good acts of virtue that will challenge them to change their outlook, not just in relation to you, but in relation to other people. Because it can prop their contract pull the string of their conscience or the cord of their conscience to change their outlook, praise God, amen? So, for I was hungry and you gave me food. We feed, we give food to the Lord when we are serving his purpose. In the same way the Lord says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. When we're serving the purpose of God, we're feeding the homeless, the, 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 when I say homeless or the poor, we're talking about spiritual poor at the same time. Then the second condition we need to satisfy is, I was thirsty and you gave me drink, praise God. I was thirsty and you gave me, so, okay, can we just leave that please? It just leave it, doesn't matter, wherever it comes out, praise God, amen. It's very important, there's a spiritual, and I need to be focused on that, otherwise, I, you know, we can get distracted, praise God. Thank you very much, amen. Just leave things be right as they are, praise God. The second condition we need to satisfy is thirst. 
He says, I was thirsty and you gave me drink. Again, the Lord identifies with this thirst. In fact, on the cross of Calvary, the one who gives the water that will never thirst again, cries out, I thirst. This is uh, John chapter 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Again, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness sake, for they shall be filled. Jesus is thirst is not just for his own behalf, because he satisfies himself as God, he's complete, he's lacking in nothing. But he limited himself for our benefit and for our purpose. The one who thirsts, I just want you to catch this for a moment. The one who thirsts, when the, when the soldier came and pierced his side, the one who says, I thirst, what came out of that rock, that rock of our salvation, that stone on the cross of Christ? Blood and water. There was ample water there to drown the whole world coming from the source, the heart, the, the, the belly of the master himself. But his thirst, again, was to do the will of him who sent him. And our thirst and our hunger is to do his will. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. Psalm 63, David tells us this. He says, O oh God, you are my God. In fact, interestingly, this psalm begins exactly like Psalm 22 in the Greek that's quoted through the, 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 the Synoptic Gospels. It begins to say, my God, my God, exactly Psalm 20. I just want to qualify this in the Greek before we move it to show how the similarities there. All the time crying to God to meet him at the place of his need. It says Psalm 22 verse 1 says this. If we turn the Greek up, it says this. If we turn the Greek, it says, Otheos, Otheos mu. Exactly, if we go to Psalm uh, 63, actually 63 verse 1, it's actually the Greek is 62 verse 1. I'll show you the Greek, if we just put up the Greek please. 62 verse 1, it begins by saying, O Theos, O Theos, mu pros se o thriso. I have to be to, before you I cry out to. It's my God, we're continually mindful of God to, to intervene in our situation. And that's what we're praying for in every step of our way, of the, our journey. We're praying for God to intervene. In, on our journey in our life, praise God. So, so the, again, coming back to David, let me just go back to the English where you understand it. It says this, my, oh, oh God, oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. It's early, continually. So when we rise, the first thing that we need to have in our mind, Lord, make this day, make this day the best day I will ever have. Make this day, make me be a blessing in this day, praise God. It says, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Wow. In a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Interestingly, the way he, he, he phrases this, the elements within this psalm, because this is not only a physical statement, but it's, this is Jesus crying out in a place of abandonment, not just from by his father, but by humanity. He says, in a place where there is no water. In fact, water is a metaphor that speaks about people. He's, he's on his own in a place where no one is around him to help. And I just want to quickly qualify this. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, he says this. Then he said to me, the waters which you see, the water, where the harlots is, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Praise God. So he's, a, he's abandoned Physically and spiritually, there's no one around to support him at the time of his plight, at the time of his challenge, at the time of his sacrifice, place God. Hallelujah. Then the next condition we need to encounter and deal with is being a stranger. Jesus was the most famous stranger in history. In fact, he says, I was a stranger and you took me in. Some take him in, some reject him. And that's why Paul says, do not neglect being hospitable to strangers, because by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. So angel is a messenger, a messenger of God. And he was the, the most famous stranger ever recorded in history. And I'll qualify this. Psalm 119 verse 19 says this, I am a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. I'm a stranger in the earth. And when the Lord rose from the dead and appeared to the disciples, and he met the two on the, Damas on the, on the Emmaus road, which Cleop Cleopas was one of them, we're told in Luke chapter 24, verse 18, they make a statement by saying, are you the only stranger, they say to him. You're a stranger. They, they think him, of him as a stranger because they didn't recognize him because they felt that he didn't know what was actually happening at the time, especially in Jerusalem. In Luke 24, verse 18, they say this, then, why, then, the, then the one whose name was Cle Cleopas answered and said to him, 
Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? He was the most famous stranger in the earth. Because let me say something. That's why Jesus says, know the truth and the truth will set you free. What is the truth? The truth is Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says, study to show yourself a proof. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of truth is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So it's, 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 it's very important that we know him. For many people, they even come to church, but God is a stranger to them. Because when your life contradicts what we confess and we live a different lifestyle, we don't know him. When we know him, we act in accordance to his attributes and according to his, his character. And we fulfill the will of God. He says, thy will will come, thy, thy will come, thy will, we say, our Father, what is him? How be done? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we have that connection with heaven, we, we translate heaven wherever we are in our lives. Praise Your will will be done in earth as it is in heaven. But that comes by virtue of knowing him. But for many people, their life reflects, their life betrays them in terms of God not being a friend, not being their saviour, not being their father, but being a stranger. Because when we, you know someone, you know his characteristics, you know his attributes, you know his behavior, you know his mindsets. And more than often time, you can second guess the friend because you know the character and the behavior and what's important to them. If you know God, you'll know how to behave like God. But when you behave contrary to what God calls us to do, then he's a stranger to us. I wish you'd get in that. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, stranger. When I was a stranger, you took me in. Are we taking the stranger in? Are we receiving him? He stands at the door and knocks. We're told in Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Why is he outside the door in the book of Revelation? Because he was a stranger to them. And oftentimes when the disciples encountered him at the resurrection, they didn't recognize him. Do you recognize Jesus? Praise the Lord. Because when you can recognize Jesus, you can reflect him in the world. If you don't know him, you won't know how to behave. That's why he says, if you abide in my word, and my word abides in you, you will know the truth, and the truth will liberate you. We want to be free from ourselves. We want to be free from opinion. We don't want to be free from the mechanism of the world that holds us back from becoming all that God wants us to be. Praise God. Hallelujah. We're blindsided. We have blind spots in relation to the things of God. We only see the things we want to see. But when God enters our life and we see through his eyes, we see things as they're supposed to be seen. We have our 20, truly 20, 20 vision, praise God. Then he says, I was naked and you clothed me. Again, another condition, situation that Jesus encounters. So experience, we're talking about experience here. He was naked. What happened when he was betrayed? He was taken by the soldiers, the Romans. He was stripped of his clothes. He was made naked. And even on the cross, they made him, they took his garments from him and he was hanging on the cross apart from a loincloth. And even perhaps that is compromised. He was naked on the cross of Calvary and he showed the Shekinah glory of God to the world in a way, a form, an image that the world did not like because sometimes we don't like to look on the truths of God. I wish I'm speaking to This is for the deep ones. This is for the ones who are eating the, the meats, not for the milk, but for the meat. The meat Christians understand when you see God in his naked, in his entire glory, you will not deny in what you're seeing because it will challenge you and it will reveal what you are because it projects. You'll see your reflection in the Shekinah glory. He becomes a mirror to show us truly who we are. I wish I, I'm speaking to someone. That's why in Isaiah, God called Isaiah to walk for three years naked and prophesy. Can you believe this? When we speak naked, it means literally naked. Took his linen, took his garments off. Just a loincloth, naked, moving. Watch this. In Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1 to 3, it says this. In the year that Tartan came to Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him, and he fought against Ashdod and took, and, and took it. At the same time, the Lord spoke by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and remove the sackcloth from your body, and take your sandals off your feet. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. 
Then the Lord said, Just as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and bare for three years for a sign and a wonder against Egypt and Ethiopia. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. Read the whole chapter for yourself. This is a prophetic indication pointing to the nakedness of God coming into the world. Because Jesus was in the form of God and he did not consider it robbery, but he took the form of the soul. He took the, the divine garment of and came naked for three years and ministering in his ministry from 30 to 33. And bring conviction to the world, proclaiming speaking to Egypt and speaking to Ethiopia speaking to the worldly powers that salvation has come into the world I wish I, I wish I'm speaking to some that's why Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 it says this let this mind be new which was also in Christ Jesus we need to strip ourselves and go before God naked we need to come before God naked and not ashamed we need to not look at dress ourselves with excuses and try and justify and with justifications. We mustn't be like Adam and Eve who took the fig leaves and covered them. So we need to come naked and, and confront our situation, confront our responsibilities before God so God can change us. Unless we confess, unless we acknowledge, God cannot change us unless we consent for his intervention in our situation, on our journey. So we need to come to him naked before him, but unashamed, praise God. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the light of someone, taking the divine garments on, implies he came naked into the world. I wish I'm speaking to some. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Isn't that powerful? So Jesus, every, every statement Jesus makes, he's identifying with what is represented in the statement he's making. When he says, Father, forgive them, he's, he's forgiving. When he says, get, get, uh, uh, feed, give someone something to, to, to drink away, he's giving it continually. He's, everything he says, every instruction he gives, every lesson he teaches, he has already fulfilled himself. He's the teacher that didn't have to learn what he was teaching, praise God, because it was his nature. That's who he is, that's who he was, and that's who he always be forever, praise God. Then we come to the fifth condition. I was sick and you visited me. Oh, hallelujah, praise God. How can God become sick? How can Jesus become sick? Only one way, by taking our sickness upon himself. Everyone's running around two meter social distancing. Everyone has masks, has sanitizing gels, has sprays, and all these things taking place because we do not want to contaminate each other with whatever is represented in the, in the virus. Well, you know, Jesus took the full force of the virus of human sin upon him. He breathed it all in himself and took it from, breathed it out of us and took it into himself that he became sick for our behalf. He, he, was, he was struck for, for our sake, praise God. That's why we're told in Matthew chapter 8, verse 17, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, in himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. He breathed in all the viruses. He breathed in all the ailments. He breathed in all the sickness. He breathed them in. And he, and he filtered them and he breathed out health and salvation to the world. He breathed it. That's why he came to the disciples. After he breathed in all the sickness, all the ailments, he came down from the cross and out of the tomb, praise God. And when he came to the disciples, the first thing he did, he breathed on them the new breath, the new, the new, the new chapter, the new, the new relationship, the new, the new dimension of, of existence. He breathed on them, praise God, and transformed them. And that's what God wants to do, breathe on us. And give us new life. Bring us health. He wants to take out the old and breathe in the new. Breathe out the old and breathe in the new. As I 53, 4 tells us, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Oh, praise God. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful statement. You know, uh, often there, there's a scripture actually in Deuteronomy chapter 21. It's just on just... Deviate just for a moment. Uh, verse verse 1. Let me just look at that very uh, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 1. It says this. If anyone is found slain, lying in the field, in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess, and it is not known who killed him. Verse 2 says, Then your elders and your judges should go out and measure the distance from the slain man to the surrounding cities. Verse 3. And it should be that the elders of the city nearest to the slain man would take a heifer which has not been worked and which has not uh, pulled with a yoke. Verse 4. 
the elders of the city shall bring the heifer down to the valley with flowing water, which is neither plowed nor sold, and they shall break the heifer's neck there in the valley. Just leave it there just for a second. It's an interesting passage because everything in, in the Torah relates to Jesus Christ. Jesus said that Moses wrote about him. And if we just come back to verse 1, watch this. It says this. I'm just going to give it license to, to do some hermeneutics and exegesis of the word of God. It says this. If anyone finds, as, find, is found slain, anyone found slain. The one found slain was Jesus Christ outside of the walls and gates of Jerusalem. Praise God. And it says this. Lying in the field in the land which the Lord your God is given you to possess. And it's not known who killed him. You see... When Jesus was crucified, people think they know who crucified Jesus. Or should I say, who killed Jesus? The ones who propagated the act are not the ones who killed Jesus. No. See, deep theology gets deeper and deeper. Because you couldn't touch Jesus unless he allowed you to touch him. It wasn't the Romans institution, legal system that killed Jesus. It wasn't the Pharisees that killed Jesus. Or the high priest. It was the father who killed Jesus. It's not known. They didn't know. who. They felt they, they, they felt they'd take credit for themselves. They couldn't touch a hair on his head if he didn't allow them. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. So, 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 so he was the father. So here we read in Isaiah. It says, surely he was born, he, he's born our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet was esteemed, and we, we esteemed him stricken, spitten by God. It was God. Who was the one who slew him, not anyone else himself. A agreement by divine counsel from the foundation of the world. Because the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Before even Pontius Pilate was considered and conceived, he was crucified. He was crucified from the foundation, who was slain from the foundation of the world. Before the Pharisees started and Caiaphas started coming in and Herod started coming against him, he was he was already it was already accomplished. They just enacted what has already been determined from divine counsel from eternity, praise God, to bring our salvation. Hallelujah. Praise God. And we rejoice, we delight in what he's done for us. Because he says he lays, take, he lays down his life and he takes it out. So I just want you to watch this implication here. Jesus Christ our Lord, after the resurrection, appears in the room in the later part of the day, in the Gospel of John, praise God, chapter 20, he appears in the later part of the day, in the room, the door's been shut, and he appears to the disciples. Do you think that the soldiers could have put, touched Jesus? Lay hold, if he didn't give himself willingly over to them, he could have disappeared from them, and they wouldn't know where he was, because oftentimes he went for the midst of them, and they couldn't lay a finger or a hand on him, because that's the nature of the God that we serve. He's there to protect, he's there to guide us. And he's there to navigate us to where he wants us to be. Praise God. Hallelujah. Coming back to our subject. Who is my neighbor? We're still getting there. Wait. Hallelujah. Number six condition. I was in prison and you came to me. Another condition that Jesus encounters and experiences. I was in prison. He was in prison. Pilate put him in the dungeon and will put him out. In and out. As he felt, he pleased. But then Pilate could not find fault in him. And he was trying desperately to let Jesus go. Because he was concerned he didn't know how to deal with the situation. And he was manipulated. He was emotionally controlled. He was threatened by the authorities, the Jewish authorities, that he had to act upon. But even trying to act upon it, it wasn't, he didn't have the last word. It was the father who had the last word in relation to his son. Oh. No one can have the last word over you unless God allows it, church. Let me tell you, people, let me tell you, friends who are watching this. Let's just go to, let's go to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 19. I want to read from verse 4 very quickly, very quickly. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I bring him out to you, and you that, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Pilate found no fault. There was nothing, nothing merited execution. He didn't do anything, he didn't create any, 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 any violence, any rebellion like Barabbas did. He didn't do anything. He didn't kill any Roman soldiers. He, didn't, he only healed them. Even the hosts and children went to Jesus and I pleaded for him to heal his servant or his son. And Jesus said he didn't see any more faith in, in all of, of, of Israel, all of Judea, as he saw in that man, praise God. Hallelujah. Then Jesus came out. Where did they bring him out from? The dungeon, the prison, wearing the crown of thorns and, per, and the purple robe. And Pilate said to him, Behold, 
the man. Oh, behold, either or anthropos. God became man. Behold the man. Prophetically, ironically, Pilate was making a profound theological and spiritual statement to say, behold, the man. Jesus became man, the son of man, praise God. Something in, 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 in Pilate's way of communication revealed something deep, significant, something eerie was taking place there, that they couldn't see in the natural eye, the natural world could not see what was going on. And, 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 and Pilate was used as an instrument by God to reveal the power and the, and the person of our Lord, the Savior, Savior Jesus Christ. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried, saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to him, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered and said, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the son of God. Watch this. Therefore, Pilate, therefore when Pilate heard that saying he was the he, he was the more afraid. He was afraid because he didn't that Jesus was so deep. And, and went again to into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Can you imagine what's happening there? There's the creator standing there if with his creation. There's Pilate, who's a governor of that part of Palestine of Israel and and he's asking he's asking him where are you from can you imagine and but Jesus gave no answer then Pilate said to him are you not speaking to me praise God are you not speaking to me do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you Jesus answered this is what Jesus answered you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Can you just imagine the emotion that Pilate's going through? Pilate could not touch a hair on Jesus said, if Jesus did not permit it. Jesus could have called legions of angels to, to intervene if he chose to. Jesus could have spoken because, because when they came to arrest him and they said, where is he? And he said, I am, avoid me. He didn't say, I am he. He says, I owe you me. The soldiers fell to the ground by the power of the I am word, name. And he allowed them to get up again, to arrest them, to fulfill all righteousness. In the same way he was baptized to fulfill all righteousness, he had to go to the cross to fulfill all righteousness. Praise God. Hallelujah. From then, in verse 12 says, and then from then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. Watch what Pilate adds insult to injury to the Jews. By verse 14, watch this, it says this. Then it was the preparation day of the Passover, about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold, your king. He says, either of us he left Simon. He takes him from being, behold, the man. This is the king. He's following the sequence of events of the glory of Jesus Christ because he rises as a king. He's the king of kings and lord of lords, praise God. He's above Pontius Pilate in kingship. Oh, praise God. It's amazing. And they, 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 they want to crucify him and he is crucified. But the one who actually fulfills this and, and, and commissions this is the Father himself through divine counsel with the Son and with the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says this, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathise with our weaknesses, but, as, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Every one of those six items, conditions, Jesus experienced them. From hunger to the prison. Everything he experienced without sin. And, and it gives us a legacy, if you like, gives us, it challenges us that whatever we encounter in life, whether hunger, whether thirst, whether nakedness, whether being estranged, whatever the situation or even in prison, we must not, you must not use worldly means to bring about divine outcomes. I wish I'm speaking to someone. If you use the mechanisms of the unjust to try and promote justice, you become, and I said, the very same thing you are fighting against. 
Praise God. Jesus did not reflect them. He transcended them. That's why he's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Praise God. The criteria, now we just move on back to our passage here. When he says, when I was hungry, did you feed me? You fed me. When I was naked, when I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. The criteria for salvation and relation with God is not dependent on ethnicity or color or social status. I wish I, I would have qualified this. It's dependent on your attitude and your actions and your way of life determines your relationship and your position with God. I wish I was speaking to someone. Praise the Lord. The criteria for salvation and relationship is relationship with God. And it's not based on anything else apart from our attitude and our way of life, the fruits of our life. Hallelujah. Watch this. Jesus did not say to the sheep who placed on the right side, you prophesied in my name. You performed miracles in my name. You've moved mountains in my name. Praise God. Didn't skip that. He didn't make that statement, declaration over them. They didn't merit to be at his right side because they prophesied. They didn't merit to be on his right side because they performed miracles. You've got you to get this. They didn't merit to be on the right side because they studied in the best theological institutions. I wish I'm speaking. They didn't merit because they were one ethnicity or one group of particular category of people. They didn't merit because they belonged to the apostolic Christian church or to any other denomination. Denomination was not relevant. It was their lifestyle, their attitude that merited them and qualified them to be at the right side of, the, of, of God the Father in the kingdom of God. At his right side, praise God. I wish you're going to get this, praise God. See, because prophesying means more, nothing more than just information. You can, anyone can give information, praise God. In fact, and I showed you last week that Jesus challenges those who call themselves prophets. You know, it's not just about people speaking prophets. God wants to produce righteousness, not just fill people with information in their brains. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, watch this, what it says here. It says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, he says to the sheep, he divides the sheep from the goats. He puts the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. He says, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was naked and you dressed me. That was the criteria that brought them into the kingdom, that brought them into the right side of God. How their actions, how they give out, how they serve the purpose of God. Uh, you've got to get this. If I'm offending people, I make no apologies. Be careful of false prophets. He says, did we not prophesy in your name? He says, did we not? They're going to say... Uh, uh, he says, he says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? They're all legitimate things. These are all legitimate in relation to ecclesiastical things, the ecclesiastical trappings. They're all legitimate things. We're supposed to be doing these. But these things are the means, they're not the ends. That's not what makes us important. What makes us important before God? Have we served God in humility? That's what makes us important before God. Not that we that they made a name for ourselves, that people pay us to prophesy, that people pray us to, 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 to bless them, that they can get whatever they want in this world. Uh, because often they have a confusion. They can't spell the word prophet. They spell the word prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T. Prophet so so that's how we should spell the prophets today, P-R-O-F-I-T. Because they're profiteering on the word of God. And God says, my hand is coming against this. I can tell you, shaking is taking place. And what is, what is standing on truth will remain. What is standing on that will fall topple over. And I've got no fear of these false prophets. Because with God with you, there's nothing you can fear, praise God. Hallelujah. And Jesus says to himself, watch what he goes and says. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name. And done many wonders in your name. And I will declare to them, I have I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And as I said, lawlessness is anomie without the law. And the law is fulfilled in love. Oh. Hallelujah. Paul, Paul qualifies this because he speaks about the, 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 the gift of the Spirit. Then he speaks about the fruits of the Spirit. But he speaks about the gift of the Spirit. By the next breath, he negates the gift of the Spirit and highlights the fruits of the Spirit, which is more important than just the gifts of the Spirit. Because the gifts of the Spirit are the means. The fruits of the Spirit is the end that gets you close into, into the, 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 the Holy of Holies, gets you to the, into the presence of God. Oh. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, praise God. So, so, let's just put, let's just put, uh, 
some content because in first Corinthians chapter 13 this is what the apostle Paul is saying he's saying if I have gifts of prophecy and if I, my faith can move mountains and all these things if I've got no, if I don't have love I'm nothing I'm, I'm, I'm nothing it means it's meaningless it means nothing to me praise God hallelujah let me let me make another few statements here to ruffle a few thick feathers our denominations do not save us our churches do not save us our friends do not save us. The only thing that changes us and helps us overcome is our attitude and relationship with God. That's, the, that's, what, that's, what, that's what brings about salvation. This is what the Lord is saying. Forget how everything has evolved over the centuries through bigoted mentalities and hijacking the word of God to control people's minds and relationship with God. The important thing what saves is your relationship with God and no one can interfere with that unless you allow it to. Oh. Some will argue and say, my church has ancient history and has its origins with the early church. You're in good company. The Pharisees said the same thing. Matthew 3.9. And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. A new generation. Forget that. It's relationship God is watching. Watch this, watch this. Luke 3, 8. Maybe some people are turning off now. Let's just see with the ratings. Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Then he said, we have got the church fathers as our fathers. Name dropping will not save you. There's some Phar there's some there's some itinerant Pharisees who name dropped, and the demons beat them up. That's Acts chapter nineteen. Read it for yourselves. You get that later on. As I said, you cookies and your tea. Watch this. He says, Abraham, uh, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. John chapter eight verse thirty nine says. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But you do not seek, but, you do, but now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You want to talk about, you want to talk about connection, association. Be what the connection you're saying, the association that you're, 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 you're boasting about. You've got to become that. Let someone slap you on the right cheek, see if you turn the other one as well. That will flash you back. The, fla the slap will flash you back to apostolic times to show what Jesus went through when he plucked his beard and he didn't say a word. Silent as a sheep went to the slaughter. You will flash right back there talking about, about adversity today. We have seen nothing compared to what the apostles who handed the gospels to us, what they went through. I wish I was speaking to some. So we need to mature and become sensible with the things of God. Some may even say our church fathers put the canonized the, 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 the New Testament, put the New Testament together. Wow, you're in good company. The Pharisees said the same. John chapter 5, verse 46. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? They quote you, we quote ancestry, we can quote this, but do we know what they were teaching? Do we know what they said? That's the difference. That's what makes a difference. That's, tr that's what transforms us and makes us exactly who they called us to be, praise God. Oh, hallelujah, praise God. Many people do not know what real church is about because we've been quite, with all this social media, what the church is about. Everyone has an opinion. The church is a theocracy, though. Not a democracy, not a monarchy, not a dictatorship. God is a the The church is a theocracy. God is leading the church. Are we going to lead God? prime place, central place in the church of our lives and in our hearts, praise God, that will make the difference. God is the God of all people, not just for some. Let's just read on, let's read on. So the criteria is not based on the version of the Bible you read. The criteria is not based on the building you meet in, whether it's an innate, ornate cathedral or it's a little shack in the wilderness, in the outback somewhere, in a remote area. 
That's not what determines your relationship with God. Oh, I wish I'm speaking to someone. Jesus challenges that himself. That's why we move so far away from the word of God. And we're letting men explain and, and, and selectively tell us what we should be believing in relation to God. We need to have a personal relationship with God ourselves. When the Lord met the Samaritan woman, which was unconventional, which, which, which um, it, wasn't, it wasn't something that they practiced. Yeah, he tra Jesus transcended discrimination and sexism by speaking and prejudice by speaking to this woman who was a Samaritan woman. I wish I'm speaking to someone. Watch this. Because he goes on to say this. Jesus said to a woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will need on this mountain, not in Jerusalem, worship the Father. But the hour in verse 23 says, but the hour is coming. Now is, he says, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God doesn't care of your nationality. God doesn't care of your culture. God doesn't care of your education. God doesn't care of your mandatory position in the world. God cares about your heart. Huh? I've been told, correct me if I'm wrong, you can write in, we've got, we should have the number coming, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe only men can be colorblind from what I discovered. Well, God the Father, he's colorblind. He doesn't see color. He sees people. He sees his creation. He loves everyone in, without condition. That's the God that we serve. And if you become selective in who you accept and who you reject, you're no longer resembling God. You're resembling the devil who divides and rule up. You get that later on. Now I'm going to finish on a few more last words. Thank you for your patience. Who is my neighbour? Let us come to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verse 25. Who is my neighbour? Oftentimes, past centuries, people's neighbour was somebody who looked like them. People's neighbour who was someone from the same nationality. People's neighbour was someone who lived in their vicinity, in their geographical vicinity. But Jesus challenges all these things. And it's powerful the way he challenges all, all, these, all these misconceptions about what God is all about, and about relationship, about religion, about all these things, by expounding upon the parable of the Good Samaritan. We have in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, it says this, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbour as yourself. Wow. You got it there in a nutshell. Two, two commandments that everything hangs on. Everything hangs on. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. He's commended him. He says, You've answered, you've given me the correct answer. But knowledge without understanding is meaningless. We may know to give the right answer, but unless we know to implement it, apply in our lives, it's meaningless information. Praise God. And then he says this, but he wanted to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbour? Jesus answered and said to him, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves and who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Remember I said in Matthew 25, when I was hungry, did you feed me? And so forth. And he says, when I was sick, did you visit me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? Watch this. Watch this. Yeah. That's the criteria. And so, uh, then he said, uh, he said uh, and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, which you expect the priest to have compassion, have mercy, have love. Today... Our agendas as church ministers are so overloaded that we don't have time to stop and look after a man who's wounded by the Jericho Road. We've got a diary. I've got to be in this meeting now. I've got something, I've got to be in that meeting. I've got to do this. I've got to do I don't have time. Let some other people do that. You know, it's, it's about taking responsibility. You'd, you'd think that, yeah, the priest, wow, here comes the knight in shining armor. The cavalry is, uh, is coming now. Yeah? Uh, and so forth. Now, a certain, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, and when he arrived at that place, came and looked and passed by him on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. 
So he went to him and bandaged him, clothed him, pouring oil and wine, and setting, set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, paid as well. There's a cost involved in compassion. Gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay. So which of these do you think, my friend, the lawyer, was the neighbour to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then said to him, okay, you're speaking about someone you consider as your enemy. The Samaritans were at enmity with the Jews. The Jews were at enmity with the Samaritans. They were inferior. They were hybrid. They were a mixture between the Syrian and the Jews when the Syrians invaded the kingdom, Samaria. And he said, this person that you see as your enemy, he's more like God than you are who have the Torah, have your religious regalia, your religious uh, uh, rules and instructions and whatever you hold dear. Him, the enemy, you become like him. He said, go do likewise. I think the moral of the story is this, is that uh, for God, it's not about nationality. And this is what's frightening, watching what's taking place on our newsreels. One person is attacking another, one person is attacking. It's not about that. We all bleed, we all bleed blood. It's not about that. If we're going to be divine God-like, we must not be driven by instinct and emotion. As Martin Luther King said, an eye for an eye, or was it uh, Einstein said that if we go by the rule, an eye for an eye, a two for two, we're going to be blind. What I'm saying is the point I'm trying to make is here is that it's a, to be God-like, to, to, who's your neighbour? Your neighbour is every person in humanity. Humanity is your neighbour. And to show compassion and mercy, irrespective of what background, what nationality, what culture, it doesn't matter. It's not relevant before God. And if I say in my church only this category of people come in, I've lost the whole plot. You lose the plot. You, you no longer are driven by God. You're driven by in, insanity. You're driven by uh, a deception. You're driven by delusion. You're deluded. It's not about that. It's about God. Looking for the eyes of you who loves everyone. Wow. Everyone's included in his kingdom. You know, when I see my friends, I don't identify them by their ethnicity or by their, their colour. I identify them by their name. He says, the shepherd knows his sheep. He calls them by name. He doesn't say, "What well, I am the Greek, Costas the Greek man. He doesn't say that. He says, Costas. He calls us by name. He doesn't identify us by anything but the love he has for us. And if you want to be godly-like, Christ-like, that's the way we need to look out the world. Stop bringing healing. Stop praying for the healing of the nations of the world. Let's stop this terror. We have enough with the pandemic. Let's stop having all these other different elements, elements taking place. Let's love them. Let love reign. Let love uh, impact the world. What do I'm talking about? Love. About Jesus. The love of Jesus. To bring unity, peace and joy. We are... I have friends in all the community, all faith groups. I love them as my friends, as my brothers, as my friends. I don't look at them in any way but through the eyes of love. And if they have any need, as the Good Samaritan, we have a responsibility to put the oil and wine of mercy into them. And sometimes it will cost us to help them. When we pay for wells to be dug in parts of Africa, we're giving something from our material sustenance to help other people. Isn't that a good thing? So rather than you spend all this money destroying, let's use our, our welfare, our wealth to bring healing, to change the nations for the better, praise God. Otherwise, how, how can we reflect God? How can we say we're God's people if we're acting ungodly in our mannerisms and our behaviour? So I pray that the word has gone forth and will execute that which is sent out to do. To know the criteria of salvation is not just head knowledge. It's not what you do worldly, materially, but it's how you serve in times of need, whatever their need might be. And I thank God that ACC, every one of these kind of challenges or these things that we identified here, the prisons, the hospitals, whatever, we are engaged, involved in. And that's what we're all supposed to be with, soup kitchen. We're helping the community, and this is what we're called to do. And this is what the support you give as a church members of ACC goes towards serving the people around you. So God bless you. I commend you for your love, your support over these past few weeks. And I, I believe our day to come back as a church, it will be the 5th of the fifth 
of July will be the first ball. So we'll let everyone know how that's going to look, what will be included. But don't feel compelled, don't feel it's not mandatory. You don't need to rush back immediately. If you feel comfortable for the next, for more than that, to be home watching live stream, you're more than free to do so. But we tell everyone how it's going to look, how it's going to work when we come back into the church. So God bless you. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Praise God. Father, we pray that your word goes forth. We pray at this time when there's so much suffering that your justice will prevail. We pray, Lord, that uh, we will look at each other through the eyes of love and we serve and we will help the less fortunate. Pray, bless your people, whoever's watching this, if you have any ailments, any sicknesses, any needs, I pray the hand of the Lord that's not short will go forth and execute that which is set out to do and will not return void. That God will bless you from the crown of your head right through to the sole of your feet. That God's blessing you. And I pray till we come back together on Sunday, maybe well with our families, our home, our communities, as we give the Lord the praise, the, the worship and the glory. And I thank you, Lord, for everyone who's helping at these times of challenging times. I pray that the climate will change, break every stronghold. In Jesus' name we say amen, amen, and amen. Does uh, Dom want to come and finish off with a song? I just invite Dom to come and lift us up. And just also to say to everyone who watches the streaming, everything we say is from a place of love to help you. It's not to condemn anyone. It's not to offend anyone in a sense to offend them, to upset people. It's just to bring you into the love of God, that you have your own relationship with the Lord. So God bless you. We love you. Amen. Awesome. Amen. Thank you for that word, Archbishop. Amen. Powerful. Let's uh, lift up the final song.
with love and liberty And I will walk with you Every night and every day You're the father of creation The risen Lamb of God You're the one who walked away From the empty tomb that day And you set your people free With love and liberty And I will walk with you Every night and every day Amen. We just want to thank the Lord for that word this evening. Just want to thank, the, just thank the Lord for, for Archbishop's life, of God, that he's had the boldness to come out and to and to give that that message to the body, Lord God. We want to thank the Lord for, for his life, Lord God, for his example, for his consistency, Lord God. And just also that, that we'll just take note of, of everything that's been said tonight, Lord God, and that will, that will really exemplify the love of God into the world. We want to give you the thanks, the praise, and the glory for tonight, Lord God, in Jesus' name, said grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and forevermore. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen, amen, amen. Until Sunday, God bless you and we'll see you then.